the SCSC, the, the Stetson Computer Science Club is putting this on. There's a couple members on, uh, or there may be more members on throughout the meeting. And I just wanted to talk about, my name is Joe Del Rocco, and I wanted to talk about uh, game development in general, like a general introduction to this. When, when we're talking about game development, there are so many things that we could talk about. I've taught whole courses on just a small section, like a tools programming course for game development or a graphics course, a DirectX course, an OpenGL course. Um, there are entire degrees, you know, minus the gen ed requirements that you can take that involve game development, game development schools, game development, you know, tracks, programs, things like that. Um, we could talk about the industry, uh, the history, the modern industry, different workflows. We could talk about um, hardware, the lineage, the different components that make it up, the kind of kind of con consistencies between them, you know, things to look out for, peripherals, the math, the graphics. There's entire entire classes related to that, and whole histories related to that. Tools, like I said, I taught a tools programming class. It was it was in a game degree, so it was mostly tools for games. You know, the asset pipeline, getting assets from artists and modelers and animators and the plugins and the processes involved to get that stuff into the to the game. Game code itself. So uh, modern companies are set up where they have kind of like an engine slash tools team, or maybe it's separated depending on how big they are. And then they have like game teams that just do the game code that leverage all the engine code that's written by the other teams. So there are specifics to the game code, you know, game loop, frame rate related things, common algorithms, common types of objects that you'd make or design patterns, how you'd access stuff, depending on the type of game that you're making, dialogue trees or how you're loading the resources or transformations of this stuff. There's just so much there. Localization, networking, yada, 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 right? I could just go on and on. So this is obviously, I mean, not only we started late, but it's only like a 50 minute talk and 10 minutes with questions. So I'm going to try to hit some high level topics and then leave some time at the end for you to ask questions, because obviously you're here for a reason, some kind of interest in game development. So I, I'd like you to ask me those questions and I'll do my best to try to answer them. All right. So I'll talk a little bit. We'll have an intro, talk a little bit about the industry, some misconceptions, and then talk about some uh, terminology, some strategies, some approaches, some general uh, information about game development. And then I'll show you some some resources. I mean, really just some links and some uh, starter projects and give you some advice on how you should get started. We're not really going to do a coding tutorial today. We could set that up for another day though. So SCSC, let me know, ping me if you want. If you have something else, maybe I can do a another like our session where we build a small game or something like that as an example. Okay, these are just some screenshots. I think they're all public domain now, except maybe the Mario one because they're so old, but just kind of telling you that, you know, the industry has pretty old roots for software development in general. That top left one, I think was called Tennis for Two, it was on an oscilloscope. Um, you see Space War on the bottom left, which was on a PDP. Pong had its own console, but it was literally, you know, I think it was Magnavox was the company. It was literally just one, the console had one game, Pong, that's it. <laughs> so you'd buy a little unit for your home and you would have some controllers on it and it had one single game. You couldn't change that. Some other, you know, text adventures, breakout on the Atari, things like that. So the industry, because of that history, honestly, because it started I'd say in the 70s, for the most part, you know, that that oscilloscope game is actually from, I think, 1958 or something um, from the 50s. But um, it, mostly from the 70s, the hardware is extremely limited at the time, very close to the metal, meaning when you program something, you're actually talking, you know, you're referencing direct memory addresses of the hardware. Every machine was different for the most part. Like if you programmed for a PDP or you program for some IBM machine, they're totally different. You know, there's, there was really very little commonalities there. So everything was very technical and specific. And so there was, when you made a game, you were pretty much a programmer. Even the, the word game designer in the beginning really referred to a developer. And some of the earliest companies, I mean, there's earlier companies, obviously, than Atari and EA, but, you know, two of the big ones there, those games were made by like one or two people at the time. Um, you know, uh, Mario is rare in the sense that you had, you know, 
I think three people there and, and Miyamoto was pretty rare in that he was more of an artist and designer where you had somebody else doing more of the program. In general, even like sound designers and stuff, you know, I had read many articles about people have written their own tools just to make the game. So it's always had this technical like streak to it or hint to it. And I think that holds today. I mean, I should say my history, I haven't worked in the game industry in almost 20 years now, but I still have kind of ties to it. I have many students, colleagues, friends, former, co- you know, former co-workers that I used to work with in the industry, contacts and stuff. So I, you know, I have not really a foot in, but I, I kind of, you know, I, I know some of what's going on and not a lot has changed in this regard. It is still very technical in nature. So even if you're an artist, usually, you know, you're better off if you have a technical side, like you could perhaps write some shaders or you can write some scripts to automate some of the things. You understand a lot of the technical of what's going on when you're making your models or your environments, uh, exporting things. You know what the system or the engine needs to, for it to be able to function efficiently. Okay, so it's, it's still pretty technical. These days, obviously, there's a lot more jobs. I mean, there's many different developer jobs, but there's designer jobs, artist jobs, sound, people who just work on sound. But again, there is kind of that technical streak. So that's good if you're in the computer science club, right? Uh, I assume everybody that's here is, is probably linked to our computer science degrees at Stetson. But if you're not, you probably want to pick up some, at least some scripting or some technical know-how of what's going on when you're working on a game, even if you're in a non-technical role. There also tends to be more jobs on the technical sector too. So if you start looking for game development jobs, there's probably more programming and scripting related jobs than there are designer jobs. Um, I'm not sure about assets, uh, artists, and content creation jobs. The, the games these days need so, especially if it's AAA, they need so many assets, so many models, environments, textures, cinematics, things like that. You know, those jobs are probably in abundance and then developer jobs are in abundance. And then the others kind of fit around that. Um, I know sound in particular, because I've done some sound for games as well. And we're always like, you know, we're like second class citizen in, in game development. Like a lot is going around the development uh, some with the design, obviously the producing and the, the writing and designing, um, but there's a lot going on around the development, the engine, the tools, and then the assets and loading that stuff. And then sound is very often an afterthought for a lot of games. You know, Some games make it, they put it at the forefront, like, okay, this, this sound is part of the game design and throughout, and that's kind of the best experience, but many games kind of treat it as an afterthought. Oh, we need to put in background music or we need sound effects. And so there ends up being like one or two people working on the sound for an entire game. Okay, now depending on the level, if it's a AAA game, obviously they're gonna hire some big name composer potentially, and that composer will write original music and then they'll hire you know, live musicians to do this with live instruments. You know, this would be really big budget stuff, but a lot of the indie and I'd say even kind of middle of the road types games, one or two people and they're putting the stuff together hastily to support what's going on in the game. So those jobs are few and far between, but they do exist. And you have, you know, producers and other people that are kind of helping it move along there. So the game industry is very cool. A lot of people that are interested in this, especially a lot of young people, but you should know that it's also uh, extremely volatile. Um, You know, just because you have a job doesn't mean you're going to have a job two years from now. There's a lot of reasons for this. There's there's a lot of competition. Defining what fun is, is very difficult. It's also pretty regional. So I'm just saying that if you're going to do game development, you usually have to move. Um, If you're in one of those hot spots out in California or Austin, it's good because because the industry is volatile, you can walk across the street if there's a problem, right? And you start to meet people in the industry from all these different companies. And, you know, you you can always have like a backup plan of where you're going to go next. All right. It's difficult to get in, but not very difficult to stay in. Once you have some titles, you're trusted. Once you've had something, you worked on some games, you don't have to really prove yourself as much. I always tell students like getting that first job is the hardest job to get anyway. And it's just harder in the game industry because at least on the development side, they want to make sure you know how to write things efficiently. It's not about your necessarily your ideas or your interests, they do want you to be interested, but they wanna make sure that you can write algorithms efficiently, you're conscious of that, you're comfortable working long hours programming, you will work a lot. 
and go through crunch times and stuff. Uh, I remember somebody I worked with at 3DO, he was on the Diablo 2 team and they went to like a six month to a year crunch. So crunch is usually that, that, la that time towards the end of a game uh, that's being developed. It's, it's usually not supposed to not be longer than a couple of months because you're working like around the clock almost. If people go to work for 15 hours, come home, sleep, go back to work six, seven days a week, it's nasty. But they went into like almost a year long crunch. It was crazy. They were like waking up each other as, you know, they'd sleep in shifts at work and wake each other up. You know, it's, I'm not saying that's exactly productive or awesome or anything, especially if you have a family, it's horrible in fact, but it's just kind of the nature of the game industry. There's this idea of like, we got to get this thing done. Requirements are changing. Publisher wants it done by this date. Things are not ready. Time to crunch. So you got to kind of be prepared for that. Financially, as a developer, you'll make more money not doing games. So it's not that games pay bad in general. Development pays well across the board. But like if you go to simulation or business, legal, you know, um, energy, all these other sectors where you could be writing software, it's more like a standard job, you know, nine to five and you're making good money, good benefits, that kind of stuff. So you, it's kind of a trade off. If you're super passionate about making games, then you can do this. Just know it's like anything people are passionate about, right? Like acting. It's very difficult. You know, it's like they say it's like 90% um, trying to get a part, 10% actually getting the part. And you have to take this oath of poverty. You could be fantastic, but it's so difficult to get in. Game development is not that bad. It's not nearly as bad as Hollywood, but it has a little bit of that. It's There's a lot of passion behind it. So a lot of people want to do it. So the economics of it is they don't pay as much as other jobs that people don't want to do. I just wanted to dispel a few misconceptions. You hear all these little holy wars, especially when people are young about this kind of stuff, like this is a better language than that, or really there's no silver bullets for programming languages or engines or tools. Um, you could make a game in anything, as you saw from, from the first game. There you go, 1958, from that picture, it's on an oscilloscope by a physicist, right? Um, you can, you, as long as you're creative, you could make a game and it can be, it could be a block game. I've seen some students, some high school students make uh, block coding games that were actually pretty fun. So there are tons of avenues. If you're working on some embedded hardware, something that's limited, you know, a handheld. And again, this mis misconception comes, you know, there's always like grains of truth to this stuff. I said it was extremely technical and that the hardware was extremely limited. So at the time, it was this notion of, okay, you need to use a language that is, you basically need to code to the metal, right? It should be mostly assembly and then some C. You definitely don't want to use these object-oriented programming languages. And you can't even, I talked to Aaron Agozi at one point, this is around 2004, five. He was, I think, technical director, lead or whatever at uh, Harmonix at the time, all of those those music related games. At the time they were they were using Lua as their scripting language. And I was like, ah, I'm so trying to move on from Lua. I was teaching the students Lua, now I'm teaching them Python. And he said, you know, I, I, we would love to use Python, but the memory footprint was just too big. You know, we couldn't fit it into, and PlayStation had like two megs of RAM, I think it was. And, and some of that was already taken up. So to load assets, to load, you know, things that are happening in the game and then have some kind of runtime libraries that are can handle all the scripting, it it eats up, eats away at memory. So these misconceptions definitely came from something. And in the tools and engine team, it's still pretty um, competitive for resources, you know, making it efficient and using as minimal amount of space as possible. But in general, you can make a game in anything. Yes, you can make a, a game in Java. Yes, you can make a game in C Sharp. Yes, you can make a game in block languages. So I don't want that to discourage you as students thinking, oh, I don't know C and assembly um, and C++ really well, so I'll never be able to make a game. No, you can make a Python game right now in Pygame. And it can be fun. People will like it, okay? Um, you know, everybody's got ideas for games. So just because you have a good idea for a game doesn't necessarily like mean anything. It's, it's the person that gets it out there. So just pick something, make your game, get it out there. And that's what's important. Uh, we all have fantastic ideas. 
but all of us get busy and can't monopolize on them. I mean, how many times in my life have I heard someone say, I had this idea, now it's this huge thing. Yes, I had that idea too. And then that day in the shower, I thought about it and then I didn't do it ever again, right? So that happens. Um, just move on with trying to make your game. Um, that copy culture thing, I mean, I'm not gonna talk about this much because I'm not a businessman. In fact, I'm, I'm horrible at it. Uh, when I saw Angry Birds, when I saw Angry Birds come out, I thought to myself, nobody's gonna play this because this has been done so many times before. We've had these physics-based games where you shoot stuff. I said, nobody's really interested in this. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> yeah. Three, six months later, and then 10 years later, I go into the store and I see like Angry Birds soap and all this kind of stuff, right? So I don't think most people saw that coming. And my point is, I don't think you can ever predict this stuff. There are many, instances of this that they're just there's success stories that, that I, it's I think it's a combination of timing and culture and uh, what's hip or cool or what spreads quickly uh, when I first saw Minecraft I didn't think it would be nearly as big as it was and it's huge you know you read articles uh, the Pokemon creator or Will Wright or whatever and you know they thought even at the time when they were making their game they're passionate about it but there's they didn't think it would be anything like it was today so I think it's hard to predict these things. If you're passionate about something, just make it, right? If you, if you make it and you make it polish, the biggest thing is make something that's not annoying, people enjoy, but it doesn't have to, not everybody has to enjoy it. If you enjoy it, your friends enjoy it, you find a little community, make it and throw it out there and people might start taking notice and then it might snowball into something. This happens very often. Um, you might think working for a specific company is going to be the greatest thing of your life. And uh, that's usually not the case either. So if you do get a game dev job, just get one. You'll learn from whoever you're working for and then use that if you want to move on. Use it as a way to segue into other companies. But, you know, very often we, we grow up like fans of Square or Blizzard or whatever it is. We think that's going to be the greatest. And then, you know, you talk to some employees there and they're like, yeah, it was all right. <laughs> it was a lot of work. <laughs> I was sleeping under my desk, you know. All right. <laughs> so it is painful making a game. So I will suggest to you up front, don't pick your holy grail game, okay? Like if you, oh, I've always wanted to make this RPG like Final Fantasy, or I've always wanted to do this. Start much simpler. In fact, maybe start with something you're not even that passionate about, but you have, you're involved in some scene and some other people are, working on it as well. Oh, maybe I can get these things working for it. Only because it's going to be a lot of work if you're actually going to finish this thing. And you don't want to burn out on your, your favorite passion of a game on your first try. When you start working together with people on a game as an indie, right, which a lot of development is now, it is hard because everybody has families and commitments. And remember, none of you are making money. You're, you're kind of just doing this to uh, to help your CVs and to learn something and to do something passionate. So you can't really expect everybody to be there for especially years or a year or six months even. So just kind of expect that. Work with the resources that you have. The good indie games, it's like one or two main drivers and then some people that flow in and out. And then once something gets going, they can see like, okay, this is going to be a product. More and more people will kind of attach themselves to it. So that's not uncommon. 80-20 um, rule is... I've encountered a lot in the sense that I think there's several 80-20 rules, but the one that I've encountered is you spend 20% of the time on 80% of the problem. So it doesn't take you very long to get a prototype of something working, but then you end up spend, spending 80% of the time on the last 20% of the problem. So I can get entities moving around on the screen very quickly, get collision working and points and menu and all that kind of stuff. But then if you hand that over to a tester, a tester's job is to break it. They're going to break it. And they're going to break it in ways you're just like, oh, gosh, how, how do I solve that? This is like a case that nobody should ever run into. And I have to add all this extra ugly code to account for this one little rare, weird scenario. And you spend a lot of time on that, a lot of testing that, a lot of trying to uh, make it bug proof or whatever. Uh, and all games, all products ship with bugs at some point. It's just getting it to a point where it feels solid enough. Um, the, the general overall user experience is good enough that it's it can be shipped at that point. The golden rule is whoever's got the gold makes the rules. <laughs> so when you get out into the industry, 
uh, you got to do what you got to do, right? Like, so if they want you to make a, a port of some one direction <laughs> game uh, from, uh, you know, some Nintendo Switch to something else, that's what you're going to be doing for a little while um, until you can kind of call your own shots or be good enough talent that's attractive to some other more niche companies. And in fact, a lot of people have uh, in the game industry, some people have more, I would say a lot of people have more canceled titles than ship titles, right? Which sounds scary, but um, because, you know, games take a long time to develop, years, usually, usually at least a year to two. Um, they can go shorter depending on, again, if you something small, you know, maybe a mole game or a, a side game or something like that, but most games take years. So over that year, what's going to happen to the landscape or the, the market? So let's say you're, you're, you're a year in and you have another year and a half to go in your schedule and somebody just came out with the same game that you guys were developing, you know, and everybody jumps on that. Now you look like the copycat and you have to start throwing in things to make it seem different and evolve. And at some point, the publisher might just pull the plug and say, you know what, we're going to put our money into something else. That happens. Um, a lot. Also, you know, restructuring budgets and things like that. It's expensive to make a game. So these things happen, things get canceled. I've definitely got a couple of canceled games as well. So the, the people that stay in the industry the longest are the ones that just take that energy and just move it on to the next project. Oh, you know, we really love that thing. I'll shelve it for now. Maybe we'll come back to it later. What's this other new project? Cool. Let's do that. Right. Think of game development as like a way of life and not like I'm making my my one holy grail game that I've always wanted to make. So here's some terminology, like a game, basically there's, um, it's really like kind of two setups for most games. I mean, this is super generalizing, but you either have a turn-based game, meaning here's the game state and it's static, right? And then you ask for the input and that may take however long, maybe the user's thinking, they type something in or they press a button, right? It could be a DVD game, like you're presented with a choice and, you, and it's waiting for the user and they press something and then it moves on to the next sequence. This is a turn-based game. A lot of board games fit that, text adventures fit that. Things where there's not idle animations and stuff going on while you're not getting input. If the user's not giving you input, the game is basically frozen, okay? Then there's pretty much every other type of game that fits into everything else. Even, even all the subgenres of RPGs, action games, adventures, sports, all of that fits into this game loop type setup. Um, oh, I guess I have some animations on this from the slide I copied it from. Uh, but basically you have this game loop and each frame, a frame is literally just one cycle. That's what a frame rate means, by the way. Like frame rate is the number of cycles you can do in whatever that measuring time is. So FPS is frames per second, loops per second. Loops of what? Loops of this game loop, this heart of the program. And every loop, it'll do things like check input from controller peripherals, sensors, mouse, keyboard, things like that. Apply updates. So when it got that input, usually that would involve like moving the player around for the input part, but also need to update the enemies based on their AI, whatever velocities they're traveling at, the bullets, whatever velocities do the collisions, particles need to, they're on some kind of time scale. So they're, you know, continually to, to flow or whatever type of effect they're doing. Once you do all the updating, nothing's been drawn yet. That's just in memory, you've updated positions and things. So if you know anything about very, very basic physics, kinematics, you have positions of things in the world. They have some kind of velocity to them, even acceleration perhaps, and you're applying that acceleration to the velocity and the velocity to the position, basically just adding the velocity to the position. And now the position moves, it's at a new space. So then when you go to draw the rendering step, this is when you draw everything. And this is a pretty complex step because not only are you drawing the entities, but you're drawing the world, you're drawing the HUDs, the maps, you know, you're accounting for things in camera, you're doing effects like depth of field, you have shaders going on while you're rasterizing all of this stuff. Certain things are clipped, right? So just like in a, in a Hollywood movie scene, you know, they always build the set. It's only like part of the scene, right? That's like whatever you can see in the camera. You don't like, there's no set behind them usually because that's all that's going to be filmed. Well, it's, it's similar in games. You have everything in your game world, but when you're rendering, you're only, you're only rendering what's in the camera's frustrum 
or you know, as, as far back as it can see the clipping plane, there's these different terminology here for this kind of stuff. And then you got to do something to keep that time step. If you don't lock the time step at some rate, 30 frames a second, 60 frames a second, 90 frames a second, whatever it is, then you get this variable frame rate, like some frames will run faster than others. And this is why like old games where it was essentially locked because it was based on some very primitive hardware and they could only do so much anyway. They all kind of ran the same rate. You run them on like modern hardware, you know, like emulate an old game or something and they're like super fast, right? Or you get these weird things where like too many bullets or enemies will show up on the screen and everything will just start to choke and slow down right? Because the frames are taking longer to render. So you don't really want that experience of things going slower and faster. It's annoying. So you lock the frame rate so that if you're above your rate, you, you eat up the rest of the time. And if you're not, you try to make it up however you're going to do that, right? Maybe you limit some things. So that's kind of the two basic setups. There's lots of terminology in the game industry. I'm not even going to address this because it's just going to be too long. But you know, just, just let you know, there's a lot in rendering and graphics related stuff, verts, polys, polygons, uh, pixels, textures, all that kind of stuff, levels of detail. There's things related to collision. There's things related to tools, events, systems, um, interfaces. Uh, we say baking a lot. So there's, that also comes from the pre-render um, community. So like the Pixar type movies computer animation, you bake them down. Basically, you do some, some heavy computations offline before you release the game. You do these computations. And then you pre-compute stuff and bake that into files, basically pre-optimized, pre-built. And then during runtime, when you've released this game, it's running the more optimized, already computed versions instead of computing this from scratch. And there's so many instances, situations of that, it's very common. Um, example would be, let's say I have a world and my sun really never moves, right? The light source doesn't move. Like you have a day map and a night map. You're not seeing it, the sun move like, you know, like Zelda or something. But like an older game is like, oh, it's daytime. Now it's nighttime. Well, the daytime and nighttime, it, the shadows aren't going to move because the sun's not moving. So why would we ever compute the shadows at runtime? Instead, what we would do is render that offline and then bake those shadows onto the textures and then just draw the world with the shadows already embedded in there. Okay. Uh, because it looks nice, looks you can get things to look a lot nicer and it's a lot less expensive. We don't have to do it dynamically. Other things you do have to do dynamically. So a lot of things in game development involve that kind of balance. Like what do we pre-compute? What are we actually gonna compute at runtime? We wanna compute as few things as possible at runtime. You wanna optimize things as much as possible. Even pathfinding and stuff. That's something that you do have to do some runtime but you could like pre-compute all the possible paths and, and optimize all the stuff so that when they do it at runtime Time, it's a super limited, um, you know, uh, uh, trimmed down version of it. Um, so that's kind of a big thing. Entities, mobs, agents, um, mobs, movable objects. This is just like terminology associated with games. But if you have any questions about that, just let me know. Okay, so what I recommend is you start small and build up. Again, you can use any language you want, any framework and just start very small. It, it, games can quickly explode in terms of complexity. So start tiny. One of the things that I did very early on that was so exciting to me, really got me, really hooked me with programming was I was following some book and then it showed some graphics and then it got that, I drew the graphics, that was exciting. And then they got the graphics to move. So adding, like changing its position, that was exciting and then getting it to bounce on the walls. So basically just making a ball bounce within the confines of the screen. And that was super exciting to me. Once I saw something bouncing around, I was like, I know how to make games now, <laughs> right? Like I started making all kinds of entities bounce around and then they need to collide with each other. Like I went from getting a ball bouncing around to writing an Arkanoid or super breakout type game within months because I could see I could see, okay, it's just bouncing around. Okay, and it's gonna hit things. Does it hit things and just reflect off of it or does it hit it and then you make that thing disappear and you get some points? Or, you know, as it hits it, does it hit it multiple times? Oh, I wanna play some music in the background. How do I do that? 
And then, okay, now I want to, I've got one map working. That's cool. I want to get another map working, but how do I switch between them? I need to do that, right? And you build and build and build and build. So just start with some, some, some very small, tiny, interesting mechanic. And you've heard people like Miyamoto and other game designers talk about that many times. Like we wanted to make something around jumping. We were trying to think of something simple and fun. Um, it's fun to jump. Well, what can we do when we're jumping? Like, how can we get that? How can we get that to feel good? Let's try it in different scenarios, right? You know, if you're going to do a text adventure game, which I recommend, they're interesting and there are frameworks for that. Just do a simple interaction first. Like, okay, let's design one room. What are the things, the interactions the user is going to do? What type of questions could they ask? Or is it multiple choice? Well, I present them with choices. And then it's basically a dialogue tree. They pick something on this list of choices. It's not free type. Or do I use some parser to figure out what they're saying, right? Get that kind of working first. If you can get one room working really nice, you can make a text adventure. Right, because all a text adventure is is a is a network of those rooms. So don't start with the network of the rooms. Start with one simple room, right? In fact, even simpler than that, start with interaction between a user, printing stuff out and reading it in, and getting that smooth, that process. What choices do they have? What options? You get that working. You get one room working. Then you can start thinking about okay, how would I get another room and connect those two rooms? Maybe once they get down to this action. I need to load the new room. And then that brings you to the load step, right? And you start thinking about how am I going to store this logical 2D array or whatever it is of rooms, this network, this graph of rooms. Um, and then the actions needed to go between them. Top-down games, Zeldas, Diablos, things like that. Also shooters, Galagas, um, 1942, those types of games. You know, get an entity, a mob, an agent, an avatar, like we said. Get that moving around on the screen. There's enough work in just that. You draw something, you press the right arrow, it should go right. How far? Well, only to the edge of the screen, maybe. Get another entity in there, get them colliding or maybe get shooting working. Like just focus on that functionality for a while and get it to feel and look good for you. And then you can start thinking about a map system, all right? How am I going to link these screens together if it's old school Zelda? Or am I going to have a camera system? So Zelda 3. So it's going to follow the play around. So I really have a big map. And then how do I load that map efficiently? So we used to do tile engines and all that's a whole other topic. But there's, you know, you build up. So any game you're going to make, you can do this. Any single game, you start small and you build up, you build up, you build up. Like even this semester, I have a student that I think wanted to do a Tron game. <clears throat> and they were probably thinking snake or something like that, right? You know, you have like a snake, you have your tail and you're, you're getting the apple and you're getting longer and you can't run into your own tail. In Tron, it's similar, the, the, the light cycle game, you, you know, these light bikes and they have some kind of trail behind them and you're trying to cut the other person off, they run into that trail behind them, then they die. So it's a similar concept, but just getting the bike to move at first smoothly and then thinking about, okay, one bike moving around smoothly. Now, what is the trail? What am I actually putting behind me? Am I, am I keeping track of that? Does it, does it degrade over time? So it's a moving thing, a moving entity. Is it only when I turn? Is it like just drawing a straight line and then I turn so it's jagged? Like, how am I going to represent that? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of work in just that. You get that working for just one thing, you know, and then getting collision with the, the out, outer wall or maybe wrapping around which is very easy to do, you know, position goes less than zero, make it edge of screen, always looks cool, that Pac-Man effect of going off one side and coming on the other side. These are decisions you need to make early on. Okay, leverage simple uh, data structures, so lists, arrays, mostly arrays because you want them very fast and usually they're not dynamic or changing. Um, remember, we, we use linked lists a lot when things are changing. Yes, if you have an enemy list, some are dying and some are still alive, but you can always just have that as a Boolean property or a bit, right? Like they're either alive or not. And if they're not alive, we don't update and draw them. But if they are alive, we do update and draw them. But we can still make an array of like 10 enemies, right? And then as you kill them, just fewer of them are alive. So we never have to reallocate that. You don't, you want to do as little dynamic memory allocation as possible because that's expensive. You're requesting that from the system. It's got to figure out where that memory is. So most games, at least the time that I was there, and I, I assume definitely still for the console, development, um, they allocate all their memory up front, and then they have some kind of um, memory manager that keeps track of, okay, we're, these pools of reusing memory for textures or whatever, because they don't want you to just call new 
and allocate something from the system. And it takes a very long time to do that because the system is trying to figure out, okay, where are these, where can I allocate this block of memory? And there's all this fragmentation because it didn't do it in a nice, efficient way. So use lots of arrays, pre-allocate those arrays, use, you know, reuse the slots for things. A lot of indexing, a lot of arrays. That's what I remember from the game industry. And I imagine that still holds because you want it to be as efficient as possible. 2D arrays are genius. They model so many games. If you look at so many old tile-based games, a tile engine is a 2D array, right? A, a tile-based game is essentially a 2D array. It's really a 1D array where they're doing some clever math, but it's real, you know, you can visualize it as a 2D array. If you think about it, an image is a 2D array. It's width and it's width and height, right? It's columns and rows of pixels information. So there's a lot of arrays and 2D arrays for all kinds of game related stuff. And you've talked about data structures before, learned about data structures or ADTs, hopefully in your CS1, CS2 classes. So you, sh you should be familiar with those. The better at those that you are, the more you can leverage them from your, for your games. And you know, when you start doing the advanced stuff with trees, you get an AI class, then you can, you can do some, some really interesting algorithms. You know, there is a difference between computer science and programming. You know that if you've taken CS1 with me, uh, but you do still need both to make the game. So there is problem solving involved. There's conceptual models. There's algorithms involved. None of that is code related. It's figuring out how you're going to solve a problem or look at someone else's solution and kind of modeling that for your problem. And then there's the, the code slinging that you're actually doing, whether it's C++ or whatever it is, C or Java, Python. And then you know that in that language, you can do things more efficiently certain ways. So you gotta kind of be good at both. You know, you gotta have some computer science skills to solve problems, and then you gotta actually be able to, to sling the code and, and implement it in whatever language or environment to get this final resulting thing. It's a lot of smoke and mirrors. <laughs> Games are a lot of smoke and mirrors. There's, there's so much more than what you see, like collisions and stuff. It's not per pixel, usually not. Usually there's so much going on with like these 3D uh, models and animations and AI running and stuff being loaded and streamed and multiplayer delay and all this kind of stuff that you want to make the algorithms and the experiences as efficient as possible. You wanna show realism, but that doesn't mean you have to compute with realism. You would have to if you were doing a simulation, right? The only difference between simulations and games is simulations are more accurate. You know, for products, for transportation, for military, for all these other non-game related industries, we want things as accurate as possible. For games, you want it as fun and pretty as possible. So that might involve, <laughs> you know, not doing very, very accurate calculations. In fact, let me tell you a story about that. And this was, I remember in a game developer magazine in one of their postmortems long time ago for the original Halo, Bungie. And um, I think it was the original one. At, at the time, when the game came out, we all had a lot of fun with it. The AI was considered really good, <laughs> okay? But this, this story highlighted some kind of uh, fallacy to that. So they put a lot of effort into developing that AI. The, the, the entities had this like percept gathering things. They could see things, not see, but like they're using some kind of collision to figure out things that are in their cone of vision. Right, um, they're they can hear things, so things produce sound percepts or whatever. I think it's like a percept system, and it could be vision or it could be audio. It could even be touch. So maybe if you're you hit a surface and they're nearby, they're getting a, a touch percept. So that would tip the AI off. There's all these like ways to kind of design this interesting AI. Well, they put a lot of effort into it, and then when they did their initial beta tests like the biggest complaint was the AI. Everybody said it was horrible and they were really dumb, okay? They had invested so much time into this in design and everybody hated it. So after much like thinking about this, reworking, debating back and forth, they ended up just literally increasing the amount of damage the AI did. Like all they did was like, ch like change the weapon system or the arsenal system or whatever it was or the game balancing so that when you were shot by a bullet, by a projectile, you received more damage. That's all they changed in the AI. And then suddenly everybody thought the AI was genius. It's kind of interesting, right? Um, it really was more about the, the, 
the player's experience than what was going on behind the scenes. When they were damaging you more, now the player stayed back more and they got more time to see the AI do interesting things like hide and roll and track them down. Whereas before, when they weren't taking much damage, they could kind of just run through it and knock off the enemies very quickly. So you want something fun and interesting. It may not have to be very intricate behind the scenes. All right. So keep that in mind. You know, you see some screenshots here, like, you know, tile-based um, systems, it's really like kind of like a big 2D array where you're like redrawing the same types of tiles over and over to create some scene. They had optimized routines and memory for redisplaying tiles and flipping them and changing their color palettes and all that kind of stuff. So many games were made like that. Some kind of fighting game, 3D collision type stuff. We don't need to check the pinky finger of the person hitting the other person. We just have some collision volume or geometry. And even the game developers rarely even use the final assets. They're just testing with the with the bounds, the bounding boxes, the hit boxes and things like that. You want to feel like you hit somebody or it looks like some kind of uh, appropriate collision happened, but you can do that with tricking the user, right? Animation itself is a trick, remember. All animation is from the old days is we have a picture and then we have another picture and another picture and another picture. You do that fast enough with slight movements the eye can't tell the difference. I think it's like, there's, you only need like 12 frames per second to trick the human eye. And obviously the more you have, the smoother it looks, but up to a point, but that's all it is. It's just, we're just tricking the, the eye. So any way you can do that. And these days there's a whole meme or subculture around bugs anyway. So it could be interesting that you have little nuances or uh, secrets or things that were unintended in the game and people find them kind of funny. Um, you know, some things are not funny, like falling through the ground and losing all of your gear, not funny, right? Uh, but other things can be interesting. So as long as it's fun and the player likes it, that's all that matters. And so sometimes you need to kind of let go of that as well. If you're making your game that you're passionate about and you're doing an indie, especially if you're an indie developer and you need people to play your game and to comment on your game, you need to listen to those people. Those people are testing it for you. They're giving you input. They're your customers. So you're working for them. Just like if you are a sandwich artist at Subway, you're working for the person making the sub or your barista. If you're making a game, you're not making it for you. You can make a game for you, but that's a lot of work for just yourself, right? You're really making it for other people. So you need to listen to them. You need to let things go. You need to fix the things they want. You need to not care about the things that don't really matter. You just kind of need to make it pretty and have it fun for them. And you will find that you enjoy that. I mean. It sounds like that's soulless or something. I mean, there will be things in it that you enjoy. You just gotta have to, you have to compromise is what I'm saying. Okay, engines, APIs, frameworks. There's lots of them out there. There are, they're double-edged swords, all right? Every one of these. While they get you off the ground quickly, there's a lot to learn, number one. Sometimes getting your idea and the things that you've already worked on, you have to kind of marshal them into the formats that they need. You sometimes have to do things uh, that aren't as intuitive for you just to be able to use this thing. Now, the better you get at using that thing, you'll be able to churn games out faster and they'll have the benefits of that huge toolbox, right? Like imagine you're, you're, you're an actual worker and you have a toolbox, right? What do you want to go with on your first day of the job, right? Like a, a toolbox that's small and appropriate and has the things that you know, or this huge, massive toolbox that's very heavy, right? You don't even know everything that's in there. You know, that could hold you back in some way but they can do amazing things. So if you know how to leverage what they're doing, you can do some amazing things quickly. Certainly many professional games are made in UE and Unity these days. And many indie games are made in like Coco's 2DX, uh, Swift's uh, Pixel or Sprite Kit, um, some of these other ones here. Obviously there's many more. These are just some that I found before this talk. Um, so there isn't, again, there's no silver bullet. Don't get involved in these holy wars of like unity is better than unreal and vice versa. Nobody cares. Use whatever you're comfortable with. If you start some unity tutorials, you find you're comfortable with it. Uh, you can start making games and you feel good about it and optimize it. Stick with it. You, you'll make better and better and better stuff. Now you should also try other things because you never know. You might like it more. Anyway, just know that that's a thing. You do not have to use an engine, especially if you're going to start one of these simple ideas that I was telling you about it, like a ball bouncing game or a text-based game, or even a little overhead game, there's not that much effort these days to get into like drawing something and moving it around. 
in fact, when Coco CDX started, it wasn't a complete engine. It was just kind of like utilities, you know, like a, a mini framework to kind of uh, help you with something. Because you'll find in games, like any software, the more of them that you write, you have this common functionality that's kind of boilerplate. Like I need to be able to draw an image on the screen. I need to be able to cycle through images for some kind of animation. Um, I need to be able to read user input. I need to be able to lock the frame rate, things like this. You'll end up writing these things over and over and over again. So those things start to accumulate into an engine. Now with the 3D stuff, you wanna make a 3D game, I would recommend using an engine these days. We used to write all these things from scratch. These days I would, I tell all my students, don't learn any of that unless you want to go into tools and engine team, which you may want to one day. So it is worth taking like some advanced graphics classes and doing your own 3D rendering. But if you're going to be on the game side and you just care about the interactions in the game, that stuff can get very involved and developers start to kind of go down different tracks. I, you know, the really techie ones start to love that way more than the games. Like so interesting making this cool effect and how can I make this more efficient? Oh, and so-and-so did this, I wanna copy that and do this. And, and so you just, you could spend the rest of your career just doing graphics and tools, right? And I, it's less interesting to me to write the menu or colliding between two entities. I've done all this extra stuff, right? And some people are like, look, I really have no interest in all that. All the, the uh, file formats and the marshalling of the data and the some of the 3D math is too complex for me. I don't care, I just want to, when the player gets shot, he makes this sound. Or um, I want the player to be able to hide behind these cover objects. Or um, you know, when they're walking or running, their footsteps should make this sound. Like that's interesting to me. I want to. I'm care more about the aesthetics of the game. Right. So you'll be on the game side, the scripting side, right? And you'll start to deviate. So you don't have to use these things. It really depends on what you want to use. Uh, so how to get into the game industry? So this is always a big, you know, topic with young people, including myself. Right. Every one of us had to prove ourselves. And it's this big catch 22. I'm sure you guys have noticed that. Like everybody wants experience and no one's gonna give you experience. No one's gonna hire you until you have experience. So you're just like, how do I get experience if nobody's gonna hire me without experience? It really sucks. So the first thing you should do is while you're learning this stuff, so ideally right now or earlier, start joining local communities. So your computer science club, SCSC, start joining that. Um, tech clubs, uh, meetups, game jams, uh, hackathons, indie game scene stuff, so forums. Join these different ones. Just go searching out there. You'll find them. There's, I mean, especially these days, it's so easy. Just, just do a Google search. You're going to find tons of hits. And then start investigating and stick with the ones that you like. Join some international communities too. Like the biggest one would be GDC. GDC is a conference that happens either in San Jose or uh, I think it's now it's permanently in San Francisco. Uh, once a year, it's usually in March. Actually, it's probably coming around right now. So there's a lot of networking and um, that kind of stuff. So I would join that. I'm not saying like save up money and go right now, but just keep that in mind. There's the IGDA, which is the Independent Game Developers Association. Usually there's a chapter everywhere. We don't have one at Stetson. We're not very big, but um, you know, there's one at a full sale. Um, there's probably one at UCF's FIAS program. Um, and there's probably one in Central Florida in general for sure. I know there used to be. You can get info about what they do and, and forums and talks. Network in general, but with substance. Don't just like go on LinkedIn and say, this guy's a game developer. Hey, will you be my friend? Can you give me a job? That's annoying. Don't do that. But um, start joining communities where you're working on stuff, especially like meetups or game jams are perfect. Game jams are awesome, especially when they're in person. Now, I know this last year has really sucked because of COVID, but we're going to get back to a time where we can have game jams in person. You can also do them virtually, but in person so much better because you're staying up really late with these people, maybe a day or two days or whatever it is, a weekend, uh, or maybe you come certain hours a day for a week or something and you're all working on a game, different games. You're all trying to hash out a game according to some theme or not, depends on how it's set up, in a short period of time. And so you don't have time to procrastinate. You don't have time to make the biggest design ever. You just have to like go, like, okay, we have 12 hours to make this type of game what are we going to do so let's start throwing ideas together it might work it might not this is kind of exciting right and you're meeting other people under that same pressure and then you start to talk interests oh, i enjoyed this game jam before and i met these guys and, hey we're working on this game it eventually comes down to hey we're working on this thing on the side right like, oh can i join that then you can start to make your indie games with other people now the next step is whether it's yourself and other people or not publish 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 get it out there making a game halfway doesn't count Nobody cares, nobody sees it. 
I've worked on some games when I was young with friends and they were awesome for about 30% of the game and never released it. And so nobody knows about it and it means nothing to the world, right? Don't do that. Put things together and get them out there. Even if they're not perfect, you can always fix them. You know, as long as you haven't invested a million, somebody's like million dollars into this thing, get it out there. If it has bugs and people start giving you one stars or, you know, they get sending you some feedback or you provide a way in the app for them to send you feedback, then you start fixing it. They feel part of the community. All of us are quick to throw out insults and complain and criticism. But as soon as the creator acknowledges us in a nice way and says, you know, that's a good point. Thanks. You know, I, I noticed something similar, but you, you found it this way. I'm going to fix it. And then you let them know they feel really good. They turn their attitude turns around big time. They, they have more respect for you and the game. Um, they may even change their review that happens often. So it's worth it to, to get it out there and then fix it as necessary. Okay. There's so many places to publish these days at the very least, put it on your own website you're on YouTube, share it on your social media. There's a billion of those these days. You could, if you Twitch stream, you could, some people develop games on a Twitch. I could never do that under pressure. Some people are making games and people like to watch them make the game. That seems incredibly slow and boring to me, but it's huge for some reason. Your guys' generation like to watch people do stuff. And that is a thing that happens. So you could do it that way. There's many um, stores that you can put this on. So indie stores like Steam store, Getting something on the Android store is a joke. Google Play, you, I could get something on Google Play by the end of the week. There's forums, communities, so people make mods. That used to be a thing. So there's all these old stories like, oh, I used to make mods for this thing and it got popular. And I worked on these other bigger mods that got popular. And eventually we started talking to the devs and the devs were like, hey, you know, you guys, we're gonna fold this mod in, do you mind? And I, I did a lot of stuff outside of school. So school didn't teach me game development at all. I know they have game dev schools now, but most computer science programs are not going to teach game development. So I made sure I knew game development on the side. That's what I did. That was my passion. And I moved out to Silicon Valley and there was just lots of companies. You're networking now. People on this, who's on here, right? Like people that are on this chat right now are on this uh, webinar, uh, this meeting. You are each other's network. You are each other's connections. You went to the same school together, most of you, probably all of you, right? You have a similar interest because you're all here. So in classes, maybe you work on projects together or you discuss ideas. And then later, 10 years down the road, one of you is working for, um, you know, some awesome game company. You're making connections now. So do that. Join communities, both locally and internationally. Network, make stuff, make sure the world can see it. Even if you're not making any money, it's, they can see it. And then you put it on your CV. I made this. Here's the link. When I'm on the hiring side of the table and you get tons of resumes. Oh, link, yes, click. Oh man, that looks cool. They made that? Okay, call that person in for an interview. Like literally that's how the process goes sometimes. It's, it doesn't sound fair, but it's the reality is there's so many resumes coming in. There's so many people that are trying to do this. You have to, you know, you, you gotta say, I did these awesome things and not just say it, show them immediately. Here is this awesome thing I made. Right. Even if it's small and not complete, they're not going to go play your game and evaluate it over a month. You know, like, sorry, so and so I played your game. And when I got to the end, I really didn't like the dialogue at the end. And it was too hard on this level when I was at level 63. Nobody cares. They're going to just look at some images and some video that a footage that you did. They can quickly see the complexity of what you're dealing with, types of effects that you did. Uh, the math that might be involved with that and then say, okay, if they really did do this, let's call them in and I'm going to ask them some questions to make sure they really did it and they're not just copying and trying to, you know, talk themselves into a job. And if they did, and I mean, if they can do this stuff, this is the person I want. I don't need to look any further. Is it good to get in with testing? I'm going to say no. I think that's an old trope. Certainly a lot of people do go that route because I hear it all the time, but Unfortunately, there tends to be a bias against testers. And I think it's just because anybody can test, right? But that's not really true. A good tester is worth their weight in gold. But for lots of companies, they can pull anybody in off the street to test. And so companies think about that as economically not very valuable. So they tend to like, they don't really care about the skill sets of those people. And if that's the case, why would they ever look into the pool of testers to promote them into programming? And it's a different pipeline. 
right? So just like the asset people are coming from a completely different pipeline, they're going to some digital media program. They're learning how to do modeling and animation and scripts and rigging and uh, doing things optimized for games and doing things not optimized, but look fantastic for pre-renders and render farms. These, this person has all these skills. That's why I want making my assets. So they're going to have a totally different track. The game developers are usually going to come from this type of program, computer science, maybe software engineering, maybe a game track or game school. Um, I'm not going to say that's ideal. I mean, it is kind of ideal because they're making games as their projects, but usually they're learning a lot of the same skills that you are as computer science person as well, or software dev person. So that's usually the track if you want to go into the programming, any side of the developers. Testers kind of get stuck in testing or QA, eventually maybe move up to a production assistant, producer, manager type. That does happen, but I don't think it's as common as just taking a CS degree and doing these things on the side and publishing to get your job. If you go and apply for a job at Activision or Blizzard or Bioware that they have open for a junior, so junior level, and you send them a resume or whatever, however you pitch it to them, and they can see images and video, and someone actually looks at it so you don't get filtered automatically because of some mishap in your resume and just too many people or something, you'll probably get some kind of invite to do a test. And then there's that whole like, oh my gosh, I got to study for this test, All right? You should be up to speed on lots of things that they might ask. You can search online for those types of tests and things. Uh, so I think that is really kind of the way to get in is this kind of advice. When I said resources, I mean like go search the internet, right? Um, these days, everything's out there. There are definitely websites and forums that are dedicated to game dev. Like if you use Stack Overflow and the Stack Exchange Network, which is fantastic, for coding anyway, there is a game dev one. And there's some interesting things that pop up on there. there. There is, of course, always the fodder, like, how do I make a video game? But there's things like, hey, I need to check collision of these two things. What's the algorithm? And then there'll be links to other stuff. So then you just kind of surf that to find that. There are sites dedicated to like collision, um, the math you'd need. If you're using Unity, there's entire forums on that. So crawling those forums and there's pockets of useful information in there. These days, there's so much... I mean, I personally don't like to watch video tutorials because there's so much in there that's not them showing me how to do the thing I need to do. I like text-based ones, probably because I'm older, but I can quickly scroll to what I want. Uh, I can search for stuff and then I can quickly parse it. But your guys' generation love video tutorials and watching things. There's so many on YouTube. Go search game development, simple game, game tutorial. You want to, you, tutorial is a keyword. Search for game tutorial or this type of game tutorial, Pong tutorial, whatever it is, you're going to find a billion results. And on YouTube, you'll find all these video tutorials of people walking through. Now, you're going to have to conform to whatever technology they're using if you want to follow along that closely. Or you can think of it conceptually. Like I know Java, they're doing it in Python but I'm going to try to do the same steps. You may run into parts where they call this function to load this image and you have to call this function to load, you know, this different function to load an image. So you, there's going to be translation issues there. But uh, if you follow a tutorial, I really think that's the best way to learn these days. Like take a tutorial, follow it. You'll feel good because you just made something. You definitely learned along the way. Maybe you really only know 20 or 30% of that tutorial by heart but you're that much better. Now do another, another tutorial and another tutorial. So many people that I know that are professional Unity developers now learn from that simple marble rolling tutorial they have. It was like tutorial number one in Unity. I don't know. I don't know what they have for their tutorial one anymore, but it used to be this little like marble, this like super monkey ball type of thing where you roll this marble around. Um, they did that, felt good. They made it look better. They started adding things, then they did the next tutorial, and then they were comfortable throwing things into their own game. There's a lot of online courses these days. So if they're not offering a course in your college, go to Coursera, EDX, LinkedIn Learning, Udemy, all these. There's just so many out there where you can take an entire course on game dev. I would kind of stray from uh, books, even though I learned stuff with books, it's really kind of old. And I find there's so many books that are just, they get out of date so quickly. So they're focusing, they're just not very good for many reasons. One, they get out of date quickly, but two, the authors tend to focus on things that aren't important, like call this function. And here's a whole page about this function. And you're like, dude, nobody cares. I want to solve this problem. I don't really care about the syntax of this function. This is not really important. 
Um, or they'll give you too much code and it's just like, copy this in, run it like this. And you're like, this isn't really helping me solve, write my own game. So I would, I would stay away from books, do the online courses and the tutorials and things. I have some stub code on my Cacti Council nonprofit um, uh, GitHub. There's, so there's some C-sharp console games there. You can take and run those if you have Visual Studio and you can see some basic console games. And then I have some Android app examples that I wrote for the mobile programming course here at Stetson. Those are up there. Um, I know I have other stuff, but I couldn't find it. So I just, <laughs> those are the only two I have up there. But, you know, basically finding some templates. And if you search GitHub in general for simple game, this is why I got to be careful about approving projects for students who want to do games, because most of the time that means they're going to just go search the internet and copy it. Not most, but I've had that happen in many of my classes. So I'm kind of leery about like when someone wants to do snake or tic-tac-toe or something, I'm like, uh, I know where that's coming from. But um, if you go look on, on GitHub, there are lots of stub projects up there. You could start with that. You could get their project running and then just make simple tweaks to it. Like I want to change the character image to this or I want to make the bullets faster, or I want to put more enemies there. Doing that is, it's kind of like making a mod, right? You're, you're taking something, you're modding it a little bit. That gives you a certain set of skills. And the, the more you do that, the better you get at doing this kind of thing. You know, that is a great question. It is a volatile industry, like I said. It depends on what's going on at the company. Good companies will always have projects going. That's the job of the administrators to have funding and have a safety net and you know they try to stagger like so the engine team is working on the next games technology while the previous game team the game team is working on the previous game that's being shipped so everybody's employed and being staggered on multiple projects that's the best way to do it small indie shops it depends on the release so um, if it's a startup usually there's a lot of funding going in if it's a good startup or if it's just some people that got together and they're doing it um, on the side, that's a lot more rough, but so you get a job at a startup and it's small, some indie company, well, they're banking on that first game. They need that to be a, a success to please whoever their funders are, be able to move forward. So yes, it is possible to lose your job after a, a game is finished, um, because the company is just not in a good state and it's not selling well, and they don't have another project lined up. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it really depends on your role, obviously. So as a developer, as a junior developer, you, when you first get on, they don't have a lot of faith in you and you don't have a lot of skills. So your greatest asset as a junior developer is your time. <laughs> so you're just going to do whatever and you'll be there a lot, you know, commenting and bug fixing. Uh, you get like the easier bugs coming from the testing department. Like, oh, I tried to do this when I did this. So you go and test the game. Yep, you can verify that that's happening and you go look into why that's happening and you squash that bug. That's kind of like an assembly line shop over there. So there's a lot of bug squashing and you're evaluated on your bug squashing. Like how many bugs are you getting fixed a week? It's kind of stressful to be honest. I wouldn't say all game companies are set up like that. That's just how they're set up. So, um, you, you know, my lead through me things like go do this simple thing or go write this thing that I'm not even sure if we're going to integrate yet. And you can see what kind of job that I'm doing. And there's some kind of code check in process where they're reviewing the code. Um, and once he likes what he sees then he started opening, OK, you know, that's cool. Now start working on this. Start start working on this and give you some more responsibility as you move up in rank, you know, to SC one, two, or however it's ranked mid-level intermediate level engineer, you're going to have more responsibility. And then that might be like a, you might have a two week or a, a one month assignment, right? You're still going to have like weekly or bi-weekly meetings. It also depends on how the software development life cycle is going on at your company. So are you doing some kind of agile process where every week you guys are reviewing tasks or, you just kind of set in your roles and you work on that and you have status updates. So it depends on how they're, they're running it, but you'll be given stuff to work on over periods of time, whether those periods are really short or long depends on your experience. Uh, once you become a senior or a lead, your job is to help everybody else. Um, I actually, I'd say a senior, you're doing some really core critical stuff that could take many months. Um, you're kind of on your own some, and then the leads job is basically to, make sure everything comes together. So the lead is dishing out tasks to everyone. They're getting the most complicated, messy tasks, 
you know, a lead is a tough job. Greatest opportunity, no problem. The greatest opportunity is the one that you find. <laughs> um, it's, it's a lot about timing. There may be, like, if you go look right now on Monster or whatever, LinkedIn or wherever you're finding jobs, there may be like 100 jobs, let's say. That would be a lot, but maybe there's 50 jobs. Regionally, most of them are going to be in California, probably, or Austin. And then there'll be fewer and fewer ones in these other places. But you apply to whatever you want. Have backup plans. Like, look, I'm here now and I'm going to school and I want to do an internship. And this is the one down the road. But you, of course, better apply to them to get your internship or whatever. Or if you want to live in that area, then do that. Um, but then maybe when you're graduating, you say, look, I'm willing to move. Then start, as long as you're willing to move, apply to everybody, right? You can't over apply. Getting that first job is hard. So I would say... The best opportunity is the one that you can find that there's a match and that you get the job and you like the job once you get it. But that's going to depend on the person where it's at, whether you, some people are not willing, willing and ready to move and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. So you got to kind of make that determination yourself. I would say there's certainly more jobs out West. No problem. I would say developers crunch programmers crunch way more than artists, but it does depend on the, the company, you know, a lot of art can be done pre-production and during um, development. It's it's the uh, a lot of the bug fixing that needs to happen and making sure things are watertight that happens at the end. But there is certainly some for the artists because, you know, maybe the designer like we just didn't tackle um, a level till late in the game or a certain scenario or a publisher says we got to throw this in. You have to have this thing. So you have a feature creep thing. Everybody's involved or you know, there's been a bug for a long time and we never tracked it down until the end. And now we're starting to find out it has to do with these assets. And so approaching the artist said, look, you guys have to re-export this stuff and you got to fix these things. And, and Or the testers are finding stuff. You start testing towards the end, right? And alpha and beta. And people say, look, if I go around this area and I look this certain direction, I can see seams. I can see the, the background behind these polygons. So that means an environment artist has to come in and fix that and then re-export it. And, so it's kind of towards the end, a, a lot of people are involved, but I would say more of the weight, like maybe a 70, 30 or 60, 40, more of the weight falls on the programmers. That's a great question. So uh, bigger companies will be normal. And I would say most companies in the game industry are normal, you know, nine to five paycheck. You're, a, you're, a, you're not a contractor, you're a full-time employee. So you have a salary. They can definitely work you more than 40 hours a week because you have some appointment like you make per year, not per hour. Now, some people like to go contract for that reason because they like to say, no, if you're going to if you're going to overwork me, I'm getting paid for that extra. So it depends on your setup. Contractors are generally not favored by companies for that reason. They have to pay more for them. And so those are kind of like a hire and fire type of per project thing like, oh, man, this project's behind. We need to bring on these extra people to help. Uh, but I know friends that, you know, they've been working so long and they have a nest egg that they don't care. They'll work six months on a contract, have a couple months off, join another project for a couple months, have a couple months off. Most people prefer that consistency and paycheck like a normal company. Um, and so you're just kind of at the whim of the, the company. You know, you just got to do what they tell you to do. If it's a really small company, like a really small indie, it can get tricky. Some run out of funding. I have been at a company that's like, guys, we can't pay you this week. Like that's happened, right? Like uh, we're going to try to pay you in two weeks. Uh, and I've, you know, I've, I've heard from some people that like later their companies got big and they're very successful now, but they, you know, owners or directors, they went to, they went through that time where they had to like round robin call people and say, can I pay you next week or the week after? Like we're really running tight on money. Like that's happened for sure. And if it's a very small indie, as in kind of more a passion built thing, then you may not get paid at all. Like, okay, we're working on something and we're all working on together. We want this to happen. We have a schedule. We are working hard, but um, this game may totally flop. So, you know, maybe we're developing it and we have features built in where like through the app store, it's like free to release and then we're going to make money. So if you sign on to that type of project, just, you know, it's all dependent on the success of it. Um, if they have some funding, which is ideal, then they can pay you for a certain amount of time up front. But if it doesn't start to generate money, then you're SOL at that point. 
So it really depends on the company. But I said, like I said, most companies, they're going to pay you X amount of dollars for this level of an engineer. And uh, you do your job. And as long as you do a good job, you'll be there as long as that company is around. And some have been around a long time. Remember, EA has been around since 1982. You know, it depends on the company and the level. If you're finding a job on Monster and it's like looking for a junior engineer for, at this company, at this place, usually that's a salary or it'll tell you salary or contract, right? And sometimes it's contract to hire because they want to try you out. So giving you three months, like three months contract to hire. If it's three months, likely they're, tr they're going to use you after that if you're good. If you're not good, they're going to say bye-bye, right? This way they got to like pay a little bit of money, see your effort. You're, you're not good enough, perhaps in the sense that you're just not getting your stuff done, you're too annoying or whatever. Um, then they're going to let you go. So that happens. That's a thing. That's like a vetting type thing. But most are like a salary type of job. Get a job. You have some time limit to you know, training, not really training. They don't do much training, but like you'll have at least a month or so where you're learning the ropes, right? Like you're learning the technology they have going through the engine or what tools that they use. And then you're eventually expected to pick up what you're doing on the tasks that you're being given by your lead. Like they're having you look into things. So in the beginning, the lead is like your best friend, unless you know other people there, your lead is directing you. They have faith in you. Hopefully they hired you and they're giving you tasks, you want to impress them. Once you kind of impress them and you've been there three, six months, they know you're a team member now. Like you can hang, you can, you can handle the assignments they've given you. You'll start to meet and work with other people. Your interests will grow. You'll get confidence. Maybe you figure out, you know what? I don't really want to work on this football game anymore. I really want to work on that project that that team's working on. How do I get over there? So you figure out how to get on to that. Or, you know what? This company is, I'm making good money, but really I want to make an RPG one day. That company's across the street. I'm going to start having lunch with those guys and see what happens over the next year and see if I can get a job over there. Right. So all these types of things happen. Good question. Any other questions? All right. That might be it. See everybody. Thank you very much. Have a good night.